All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the weekend edition of Ask the Experts. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom Pihota, the Vice President for Research here at Chapman University. Thrilled that you're able to, to join us during the weekend, whether you're joining us on, on Zoom webinar or whether you're joining us on Facebook Live. Um, glad that you could join us over the weekend here. Um, Ask the Experts is something that we've been running here at, at Chapman for, for several months now, um, where we bring together experts from uh, Chapman University, but also from the outside to discuss relevant issues in our community um, and in the US. Uh, today, it's going to be a very interesting discussion around the, the middle class and the struggles of the middle class, um, led by some really great experts. Um, this is an interactive format. So we really encourage the uh, participants, uh, the attendees to uh, ask questions. There's opportunities for you to ask questions by posting into the question and answer box in, the, uh, in Zoom or in Facebook Live. You can paste, post that into the discussion portion of that and we'll, we'll have time to uh, discuss those questions. Um, this is an hour and a half long and we're gonna have some presentations by our by our panelists, and then we'll have a, a good amount of time allowed for discussion also. Um, so with that, I'm gonna let the program get started and, and stop my introduction, but I first wanna introduce uh, a couple of our panelists that will, that will kick it off. Uh, the first person will be the moderator for the, uh, for the webinar today. Uh, we're really fortunate to have Steve Pontel be our moderator. He's the CEO and president of National Corps which is one of the largest nonprofit developers for affordable housing and, and senior housing. Um, the first people that will be presenting are Joel Kotkin. Um, he's a presidential fellow in urban futures at Chapman University and Marshall Toblanski, a clinical assistant professor of management science at Chapman University. Joel and Marshall are both uh, veterans of ASI experts. So we're, we're thrilled to have them back and, and so is Steve. So. With that, I will turn it over to Joel and Marshall to make their uh, opening remarks and opening presentation. So thanks, Joel and Marshall. Well, thank you, Tom. Thanks for, thanks for having us back on Ask the Ex Experts. Um, we're looking forward to what I think is gonna be a really lively and interesting discussion um, with our panelists who have just a wealth of knowledge to share. Uh, but um, let me just, uh, share our screen here and um, give you a little context for the discussion. Joel, you wanna kick us off? Yeah, sure. Um, what we're really talking about is um, one of the things that's happened in the last few years, which is really the, um, the shift away from a middle-class country, which America was always known as, to a more bifurcated uh, country uh, dominated by a relatively small group of people um, and a large group of people who are essentially um, have very little um, in, um, interest and in, uh, involvement in the economy. They're very marginalized. So we've had that same thing happen in the Middle Ages, concentration of property in few hands. Politics were dominated by theology. Uh, you have right-wing the theology and left-wing theology and not a lot of realism. The lack of upward mobility, which is really our biggest concern, um, it... Um, you know, I was just uh, thinking, you know, last week I buried my, my mother and, you know, somebody who grew up in the slums of Brownsville and she and all her brothers and sisters and virtually all her friends uh, made it from the working class to the middle class. I think that's becoming harder and harder, easier in, in the boomer generation, much harder for millennials. Um, stagnation and poverty have continued to grow. And um, one of the biggest problems is obviously that people are not very literate, and that's also very much like the Middle Ages. Um, one of the biggest problems that we've been writing about at Chapman in particular has been the problem of affordability. And as you can see, California housing prices relative to incomes were always very much on the national level. So if you you moved, let's say, from Michigan to uh, to Los Angeles, you were paying fairly similar housing prices. You can see that has changed dramatically. Um, and relative to incomes, it's changed dramatically. So if you look from 1969 to 2018, this um, in California, um, the prices have um, 
of the average price relative to income is about 7.3. Uh, in, in LA, it's nine. So part of the big issue that we have is people both don't earn enough money to afford housing in many parts of the country, particularly here in California. Um, and at the same time, uh, people um, are finding housing prices going up. So this, this disconnect between housing prices and incomes is very serious. Um, and then if we look at the ways how people move up historically, um, it's been basically uh, through education. Um, my own pa uh, parents' generation um, and even our generation had relatively affordable education and fairly decent education at the high school level. As you can see um, in many of our states, particularly some of our bigger states, uh, California, Michigan, um, uh, as examples, um, also uh, Oregon, Illinois, uh, poor students do very, very badly. And the quality of education, even pre-COVID, was really uh, quite terrible. The, um, all of this has translated into a world where um, there is a growing bifurcation, as Joel said, not only in um, living standards, but in jobs. If you look at the jobs that we kind of consider to be next generation jobs, jobs that are um, based around um, providing professional or technical or scientific services, the growth rate of those jobs um, is highest in places like Texas and Utah, lower cost, places with lower costs of living. The um, traditional hubs of those jobs, New York, California, Illinois, are significantly below the national average. You can see here that the California number, for instance, is 19% versus the US average of 26%. And that's growth in jobs over the past decade. Um, that doesn't mean that we've not added jobs. In fact, in California, we've added a lot of jobs. It's just that most of them pay below the uh, median income. And actually 48% of the jobs that were added in the last decade uh, pay under $40,000 a year. So net net, we're losing the middle class jobs, the jobs that pay between the median and say $100,000 a year, we actually saw a drop in those by 4,300 jobs over the past decade. So if you add to the, to, the, to the mix, the notion that it's expensive to live here, the educational system is not performing the way it should be. Opportunity for, um, for the middle class in terms of employment is dropping. What do you think is gonna happen? The answer is we're gonna see out migration. And so this is a chart of 2010 to 2018, which is the latest numbers that we have. Uh, and you can see that the move out of California is accelerating. If you look at it even on a local level, um, the only place in the Los Angeles area that seems to be holding its own is Riverside County. Everybody else is uh, basically um, uh, having people leave. Um, if you look at this across the United States, the LA area is not unique. New York is losing, is having people, uh, are having people leave without migration. The Chicago area, Illinois is, is, is uh, losing people. These are the lowest it net in migration areas. And where are they going to? They're going to the warm weather, lower cost areas. Cape Coral, Florida, big for retirees, Raleigh, North Carolina, Austin, Texas, Sarasota, Florida, you can see there's a big move toward places where the cost of living is much lower. So um, basically what we're concluding and hopefully this will be um, taken up in the discussion. We've heard a lot about an urban renaissance um, and there certainly has been one in the sense that the deterioration that took place for many years has slowed and in some cases reversed but poverty in cities has actually gotten worse. Um, Urban areas have been particularly hit by the pandemic um, for lots of reasons. People um, are have harder pro uh, problems with uh, with social distancing. Um, transit seems to be a big um, uh, spreader. The lockdowns are very, very hard on minority businesses. 
I mean, one of the great tragedies of the recent disorders has been that many of the businesses being destroyed are being are owned by small business owners who are minorities. And of course, one of the, the great um, ironies here is that these were people who were already getting hurt by the pandemic. Um, the protests were of course themselves legitimate, but the looting and burning is gonna make it much harder to bring investment into cities. And then some positions, um, I think uh, Willie Brown said that defunding the police was the uh, maybe the stupidest uh, slogan ever developed. Um, and certainly what we're finding in the in what we're looking at is actually many of the people who wanted to fund the police are people who live in comfortable, safe suburbs. And the people who least want it often tend to be people who live in the inner city. Um, the the uh, uh, COVID um, has been an accelerator of feudalization. As you can see, the, uh, the people at the top 25%, 60% of them can work at home. Um, you get to the bottom 25% of income, only 9% can work at home. So uh, this has really accelerated things. Uh, the lower income workers have, have lost their jobs much more than higher income. So all the problems we had with inequality have just gotten worse. They're more intense in dense urban areas, not just by how many people per square mile, but how many people live in crowded housing, which is again, something that happens in part because of the uh, affordability issues for housing. Um, and um, the reality is most people still want uh, detached houses, but right now either they can't afford them or, and in many cases in places like California, Oregon, uh, uh, Minneapolis, um, they're increasingly um, difficult uh, to get to the government. And the job losses in the pandemic have been most severe, mainly in large cities, except for those cities who are, that are dependent on tourism. But New York, LA, San Francisco have all been hit very hard uh, by the pandemic. And then uh, just, uh, this is new research. It's the first time anyone's seen any of this. Uh, we, did, we did this um, for the uh, um, Urban Reform Institute um, uh, in Texas. And what we found is that Hispanics, for instance, do better outside of the Washington DC area in smaller and predominantly Southern and Sun Belt cities, but also in some in the Midwest, they do worse in the most uh, expensive coastal areas. Same pattern for Asians, although they do better and uh, same pattern uh, for African-Americans. Basically, uh, and what we're seeing is that African-Americans and Latinos in particular are doing better in lower cost areas. That's where they're moving. That's where their incomes are higher. Um, and so um, really what we're finding is whatever we're doing in many cases in the progressive world, um, it's not working for the people it's supposed to be helping. So um, just a few quick things um, that Marshall and I have come up with. Um, first of all, I think this idea of let's go and give people more welfare, I, I don't know why they think that works. Um, I mean, obviously you don't want people uh, to be destitute, but we should be really work uh, learning how to develop better paying jobs, supporting uh, small business, uh, protecting uh, uh, antitrust. I think obviously companies like Google and Amazon are uh, beginning to make it very hard for uh, competitive businesses. We have to reform education right now. The big shift is towards indoctrination. Um, I don't think employers are looking for people who have degrees in postmodernist English um, resentments of uh, one group or another. They want people who actually have skills. Um, and I think we have to move in that direction. Um, in California, New York, um, and many of the coastal states, um, mid-skilled jobs that pay well are just simply being wiped out and in many cases moving elsewhere. And also we have to promote development jobs in the periphery where costs are less. Unfortunately, government policy um, works against that. And so companies are forced to either stay where they really can't afford to stay or leave the state. And of course that's happening here in California. And at the end, I think it's Im important to understand uh, and go back to the original um, meaning of the civil rights movement that, uh, from Dr. King. Uh, and I'll read this out just because I think it is such a, a great statement. If a man doesn't have a job or an income, he has neither life nor liberty nor the possibility 
for the pursuit of happiness. He merely exists. So we have beautiful words in the Declaration of Independence. We have beautiful uh, concepts in the Constitution, but we have to begin to get back to the fact that more Americans have to have a role in the economy and some hope that things will get better. So thank you, Joel and Marshall, for setting the stage. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to what I think is going to be a very interesting discussion. One of the questions we actually have, and I'm going to let each panel, me panel member answer this as they see fit, is are any of the panel members in the middle class? Which is kind of an interesting question because uh, how the middle class is defined is often self-defined. Uh, to kick the second part of our conversation off, is Professor Michael Lynn, the author of tw in 2020 of the New Class War, a professor at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Lind, kick us off. Unmute first. <laughs> yeah, okay. In my book, The New Class War, I don't even use the term middle class. I think I argue that North America and Western Europe are seeing polarization between the working class majority, which is about two thirds of uh, citizens who have a high school education or no more, and what I call the uh, managerial professional overclass. And the big class divide, it's not so much money, it's uh, college credentials between those who finish the equivalent of a four year uh, college or not. Now it tends to track uh, money fairly closely, and what we see is this reflects in growing polarization within the uh, labor market. Uh, uh, the previous speakers have touched on this. I'm not going to show you a slide. I'll just summarize it. The Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, every uh, few years updates its projections for the next 10 years. And if you look at their latest update, uh, the 2019 to 2029, in terms of the most numerous jobs being created, and let me stress that in absolute numbers, not the fastest growing jobs categories, but the most numerous jobs being created. The top three are home health aid, $25,000 a year, fast food worker, $20,000 a year, and restaurant cooks, $27,000 a year. But to see the polarization, the next three jobs uh, all pay much better and require a college education, unlike the three I mentioned. Uh, and that is software development workers, registered nurses, and uh, uh, general and operation managers. Uh, the software development uh, workers, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, make on average 107,000 a year. The registered nurses, 73,000, and the general and operations managers, 100,000. So if you look at the top 10 jobs in absolute numbers that will be created, and I followed this, uh, BLS data for 20 years, and usually they're right. Sometimes they're wrong, but, but this is pretty accurate data. Uh, of the top 10 jobs created between now and 2029, 20, six out of 10 will not require any college education whatsoever. So when people say that, you know, we need to send more people to college, uh, arguably we send too many people to college, uh, but, but certainly a majority of jobs uh, in the next decade or two will not require a college education. All it takes is high school education, a little on the job training. Four of them will for uh, uh, really good jobs, which in, in addition to registered nurses, general managers, software development, includes medical managers. And this brings me to the second point I want to make. Uh, we are told that globalization is driving down wages in the US, and that uh, is certainly arguably the case in, in sectors exposed to international competition like manufacturing, where there's been a lot of offshoring, a lot of uh, 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 destruction of American jobs by subsidized imports from other countries like China. So in the manufacturing sector, which employs a little more than 10% uh, of American workers, the globalization story works. It doesn't work with home health aides. Their jobs cannot be outsourced to China. Uh, that, that's also true of fast food, work, fast food workers, restaurant workers, uh, some of these other low wage categories like stock laborers and uh, uh, groundskeepers who will, there will be uh, more restaurant cooks 
then there will be software engineers in the US in the next 10 years. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, that's what you would expect in a society where you have more automation, where you have fewer factory jobs, even in the absence of uh, globalization. So out of curiosity, I looked at Germany. It's another industrial country that is exposed to the same kind of you know, global competition that we are. Uh, and it turns out that a lot of these low wage jobs are paid much better in Germany. So for example, home health aides in the US make 25,000 a year in Germany. It's about 32,000 in, in US dollars, which is about 150% more. It's not great, but, but it's certainly better. Uh, and so on down the line. Uh, so what is the difference? Well, it can't be that the home health aides in Germany are better educated than the ones in the US, they're not. Uh, it can't be globalization in some mystical sense. It can't be technology. Germany is a high tech. What is it? Well, ultimately, it's labor market institutions and government uh, and unions, particularly unions in the service sector, which we lack in the US. Uh, that's the big key. Uh, unions uh, allow workers to pool their numbers to bargain for higher wages. Now, if you're a consumer, you may not like this. If you're an employer, you may not like this. But the fact is, what we call the middle class uh, of the industrial sector in the 1950s and 60s, the Europeans call them working class. That is, uh, these were high school educated factory workers, sometimes clerical workers. The reason they made more money in the 1950s than in the 1920s when, when they were paid dirt wages was because of unionization. They were doing exactly the same kind of jobs. They didn't have any higher education than they did in the 1920s, auto workers. They had unions. Uh, that, that could compress wages and, uh, and extort higher uh, pay. So uh, I, I think that's something we need to think about because when we say, well, everyone needs to go to college, the jobs of the future require uh, college. Some of the jobs of the future do. The majority of the jobs that Americans will be doing in the next 20, 30 years will not require any education, maybe a little on the job training or uh, some community college training but certainly not a BA. Uh, so the, if, you, if your real concern is low wages, then maybe we should just raise wages. Uh, and historically, there are two ways to do that. You know, one is through unionization and collective bargaining in particular sectors. And the other is a higher inflation adjusted minimum wage. But you know, Napoleon, I'll conclude with a quote from Napoleon. He said, uh, if you want to invade Vienna, Invade Vienna. If we want to raise wages, maybe instead of saying, oh, we'll get, send people to get master's degrees and we'll do this and we'll do that, may, maybe the answer for a lot of these very low wage occupations is just higher wages. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So now we have uh, Martin Luther King and Napoleon. Pete, I can't wait <laughs> to hear who's going to guide your, uh, your comments. <laughs> Uh, we're very fortunate to have Pete uh, Saunders with us today is a writer and researcher whose work focuses on urbanism and public policy. But as if not more important, he's a practicing planner working in the suburbs of Chicago. Pete is also on the uh, board of advisors for the Center of Demographics and Policy at Chapman. Mr. Saunders, please share with us. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say that I can't agree more uh, with what I've heard so far and everything that I uh, am going to talk about kind of reiterates the points made by uh, Joel and Marshall and Michael. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna bring a little bit more of a, a local focus. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am based in the Chicago area, have been working in this area for the last uh, nearly 30 years now. And uh, I've seen what happens when the kind of bifurcated economy uh, emerges here when it does not have the steady influx or inflow of uh, people uh, coming in from elsewhere in the country or internationally. Uh, the Chicago region has been one that's been pretty stagnant in terms of population growth, job growth over the last uh, 20, 30 years or so. Uh, and the bifurcation is, is really evident with the uh, increasingly uh, growing and stronger uh, upper middle class, professional and managerial class, I think Michael put that very well, uh, that is concentrated on our North Lakefront 
and then a service class, working class that is uh, living elsewhere throughout the, uh, the rest of the region. Uh, I think that the COVID pandemic has really exposed and, and accelerated a lot of these, uh, 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 has accelerated the fissure that we've seen here. Uh, I think that our, uh, 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 our desire to call out uh, the, the agriculture workers, delivery drivers, the cashiers, people like that as uh, essential workers is really an indictment of uh, where we are today. And I think that uh, we need to uh, not just express gratitude, but uh, as Michael said, we need to start considering how to pay them more. Uh, I'm not gonna go through a whole long uh, history lesson here. Uh, I think uh, how we diverged and how we ended up in that way has really been explained uh, by the previous speakers. However, I would call attention to uh, a website that I think also highlights that. There's a website called WTF happened in 1971.com, which is a really interesting website. website. It really has uh, a series of charts that show how there was such a divergence in any number of uh, characteristics that started in the early 70s. Uh, changes in production, changes in wages, changes in unionization, changes of all sorts that really explain how this is a long-term phenomenon that's been in place for uh, going on 50 years right now. Uh, I come from a place uh, in Chicago. Uh, I was also raised in Detroit uh, where the manufacturing sector blossomed. And uh, that's something that uh, really helped to build the foundation of the middle class. And as that has eroded, we've uh, seen more and more of those jobs lost and fewer and fewer people able to have the kind of upward mobility uh, that we've, uh, you know, that we've witnessed that helped create and sustain the middle class. So I think that's the problem that we have right now. And I think we're at a point where, uh, like I said, the pandemic has uh, accelerated those and brought the uh, all to light and uh, it's forced us to action. Uh, as far as my approach to uh, helping the middle class, I'm looking at short, mid and long-term strategies. You know, I think on the short term, uh, we're looking at how we can get uh, federal assistance. I know that uh, the HEROES Act is something that has been discussed in uh, Congress. And I know that there are people who are hurting. Uh, I'm thinking that that is something that uh, in this period of pandemic is something that uh, people who are uh, arguing to strengthen the middle class uh, could, uh, could argue for the kind of supports that they have. Uh, and as a midterm strategy, uh, I certainly agree with uh, increased pay for essential workers and service workers, higher minimum wage included. Uh, as a long-term strategy, I think we really need to do more to uh, support the development of the infrastructure to support essential and ser uh, service workers. Uh, looking at uh, free or perhaps subsidized community college that helps build skills for uh, essential and service workers, better workforce training efforts, uh, and bringing, uh, as Michael suggested, uh, unions back into the mix, particularly in the service sector. So those are the kinds of things that I think uh, short, medium and long term that we can do. But this has been a path that we've been on for quite some time. And uh, we, I think the pandemic is giving us the impetus to be able to make the shift now. Thank you, Pete. Um, some good insights. I think we'll have some fun conversation in a minute. Uh, to finish our final presentation, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Carla Lopez Del Rio. Um, Carla is a community development professional committed to empowering working families to build wealth and to build thriving community. Uh, she's done work throughout Southern California and is also on the board of advisors for the Center of Demographics. Carla, please share with us. Absolutely. So I want to um, focus on a, something that's a passion of mine, uh, and that's housing. Uh, that's how I met Joel, uh, through a housing advocacy group. And I want to talk about a little bit, uh, just want to contextualize a couple of things. Um, the first one is uh, this idea of the COVID um, uh, situation. Either in life to me, either you work for someone or you own something. So it's important for people to understand that we are under this context when we are talking about the future 
it, we cannot go back to what was before. Um, this definition of the middle class, um, it's really important to understand that when we refer to the middle class, uh, we don't think of uh, you know, the, that middle class that had a home and had a car and had vacation and savings. The middle class, uh, at least in my age, a middle class is somebody that can pay their bills basically and uh, have maybe a little bit of a cushion of time uh, if they lose their job, but they're, they're definitely not building wealth. We're not building wealth. Um, so it's, I, do, I do agree that we need to increase income, but I think uh, income, how do I say this? You don't retire on income, you retire on investment. So here is a, here is a problem that I have seen uh, exacerbate over the last, um, well, last decade I've been working in this, but of course longer. Um, so let me share my screen a little because I like to be a little interactive. So if you can see here, um, why, why me as a Hispanic woman do I care about um, investing? Well, if we're talking about income, um, Hispanic income is very low, even though it's going up, it's not enough to have, um, to be able to invest. And I wanna talk a little bit about my story because I think it sort of gives, um, gives you an idea of where I come from. So I'm an immigrant. I was brought here when I was 15 years old. Um, I did have, um, I didn't grow up very uh, rich. Um, so I decided to go back to school. It's a, it's a long story, but I got married when I was young. I had a kid when I was young and uh, I got divorced when I was young and I ended up being a single mom. Uh, but I decided to go back to college and I was able to do so um, on welfare. I was on welfare while I was in, in Berkeley <laughs> at the University of California in Berkeley and I had a kid. Um, and then after I graduated, um, I, there was no transition plan for me to come out of welfare into the, the labor market and have a, an actual opportunity of paying the rent. So I ended up living with my mom and my kid, and it took me a long time for my degree and my experience to be able to give me what I call now my middle class life, which is really not um, anything fancy uh, at all. I mean, that is the back of my garage. <laughs> I was sharing with everybody that that's the back of my garage. Um, so I have adapted, but I am definitely not a wealthy woman. So I wanted to share that uh, in order for me to feel a little more secure, um, investing into a home was extremely important. So home ownership for me was really, really important. And uh, your net worth is really important. So your net worth is Whatever, uh, whatever money you have minus your debt, right? And what we have seen in the, in the past years is that the middle class or the people that have the ability to have a net worth that allows them to have a retirement is going down. Um, and then when you put a racial uh, filter over it, you can see that blacks and Hispanics, and I don't have the information for Asians, but that's an important uh, data point that we should start collecting. Um, there's a big difference between the net worth um, of uh, those uh, individuals. Um, and a lot of it is tied to the equity of their home. So in, in this chart, it, can, it shows you how much of the equity um, of the home goes into what an investment means for people. So why is there this disconnect? Um, I, I was looking at the, at the news and this is a January 2020 uh, Wall Street Journal um, that's saying that state and local governments are grappling with how to create more rentals to combat the rising cost of middle class and lower income families. But as much as 80% of the new supply of this, new, of this year will be luxury developments. This is not helping the people that need the housing. We are not building housing for the people that need it. And it also reminds me of, of where we are besides the pandemic. We are also undergoing a industrial revolution type, right? Uh, we are going through our own technological revolution. And I wanted to talk about housing in the Industrial Revolution. Um, it was not um, up to par, right? Uh, workers had this uh, four penny coffins in which they could sleep, but you know, that's all pretty much they could do. And I, can't, I juxtapose this with our technology revolution and how our educated uh, millennials are leaving now. This is in downtown LA. This, uh, this is a bunk bed that you can rent for a thousand dollars a month and it includes the ability to be able to shower and have a place to um, sleep. And, but you can tell, I don't know if you can tell, but there's, uh, it's, they're kind of high-tech bunk beds, you know, they have these, uh, these screens, but you can tell that they are not Hispanics and they are not Black. These are uh, middle, what you would expect to be the middle-income uh, 
folks of, of society, but they are struggling as well. Or you can rent a shed in San Diego in the backyard for $1,000 a month. And um, I think it's about 400 square feet. So <clears throat> my point is that we are not producing the housing that people need. And I think um, this is going to be my other point. Um, we are trying to create too many jobs in, the, in, in certain centers. And we need to start thinking about technology and the new opportunities that it brings. So uh, the way that it works, I live in an exurb uh, uh, away from LA in, in Eastvale. So I'm about an hour and a half to two hours of traffic to get to work. Let's say if I worked in, in downtown LA. There are not a lot of public transit, but even if they brought public, public transit to connect all of the hundreds of thousands of people that commute from the inland California to the coast, um, you would find that it takes a huge toll on people. It's not a great opportunity. Uh, 90, 90 minutes and plus, most of the people that have the 90, the super commuter, which is an hour and a half each way, um, will, will be uh, public transit. So that is not uh, an option. Also, it's not an option to have this situation. I'm sorry, this sharing of screen, I hope that you can see. It's also not have um, this situation where, you know, this is a heat map that shows you how people commute from the outside into the coastal. And this is like standing in line to get into the, the stadium, right? It's, it's an unpleasant, uh, it's an unpleasant uh, commute. But um, also it has a huge uh, toll on, um, on family. And I think we don't talk about that very often. 40% of uh, super commuters, people that have longer commutes than 45 minutes and even super commuters are 40% uh, more likely to get divorced. So it is taking a toll on our social fabric as well. And there's so many, so many other um, things we can talk about about the social fabric, but that's just one example of how commuting is not working. So I think uh, COVID is giving us some opportunity to explore other, uh, other areas. And I am not saying this is, a, um, this is just one solution that I can think about, okay? We, we're gonna have to come up with a lot of solutions and a lot of ideas. But one idea that has been floating around for a while is this idea of working from home. And I think the COVID-19 gave us the opportunity to rethink how we uh, work and where we work. So if we are going to continue to live this way, or if we can start thinking of new ways of at least releasing some pressure from this commute, I think would help. So one of the interesting things that I found was Tulsa, uh, the city of Tulsa is um, having this, this idea of hiring people from uh, from the coast, you know, and inviting them into the heartland, sort of like going back through uh, Route 66, right? And what they're saying is that we will give you $10,000 cash and some space for you to come and work and some perks and some community, a welcoming community that will allow you to have a home. Um, well, I don't know, they're not selling a lot of home ownership here. I see a lot of rentals. But what I do, what I did see is that they are trying to call on people who want family and community. And I think that if we are going to think of any type of recovery, we really need to start thinking about home, not just as the houses that we, that we build, but also as the communities um, that we, where we uh, thrive. Um, and I want to reconnect with Pete on this because this is my last point. I'm at a point in my career where I have, I have realized that this renaissance that we are talking about um, is, it has to come from people. If we are going to talk about renaissance, um, you know, technological re renaissance. In the renaissance, the government did not come and, and fix things. It was us, it was people coming together and thinking together. And um, Pete and I had a conversation before this presentation where I called him and I said, you know, I'm a civic engagement um, expert. I, I worked for the Census Bureau and the last census count, I was one of the lead partnership specialists in, in this area trying to get the count up. And one of the things that I noticed was that it was much easier to um, help with the count as a government where people were organized and they had community rather than the places that didn't. It was difficult to get the count up uh, where I didn't have leadership and thoughts and, and ideas that would help me do my job best. Um, and this is something that I was talking to Pete about. And Pete, I don't know if you can join me just for a minute in my presentation, but you said something that was very telling for me and it's that you are a planner and you really don't get community input. And I think that we need to start taking this civic engagement very seriously, particularly because we care about democracy and democracy requires high, uh, high 
uh, levels of civic participation and we're just not having it. And the reason why we have civic participation is because we need to give input to the government. We are the government. I was a civil servant, but I was also a resident. And this is something that Pete agreed with me. Pete, can you repeat what you said to me over the phone? When yeah, I told sure. You uh, yeah, basically I had said that uh, uh, civic participation and community engagement is crucial to, uh, I believe the, 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 it's the foundation of our democracy. And I think it's really necessary for, for planners such as myself to be able to get the information we need to create the communities that we need. So I, uh, I don't know what it's like in other parts of the country, but it's been a critical aspect of everything that I've done throughout my career as a planner. And I think that that is our responsibility, not any, not the representatives. The representatives are representatives of people. It is our, our responsibility to gather together and to come up with solutions and not just come and demand uh, you know, services from the government. We're here to, to build this country together. This com and we start with our community. That's the way that I see it. So none of this stuff is going to be solved by Joel or Marshall, any of these experts that we call it. It's by us and you, the people that are watching right now. Thank you, Carla. So if now we're going to try and knit this together so that people can walk away with uh, maybe a couple of interesting thoughts about you know, what kind of a platform would some of these ideas look like. And so let, let me kind of go back. And all five of us are now going to participate in this. And feel free to, as Carla just did, ask each other questions as well. Um, so let me start with this uh, welfare versus work recommendation that Marshall and Joel had, uh, because there's been a number of comments about increasing salaries or increasing wages, um, potential unionization in certain categories. You know, uh, there have been a lot of efforts around workfare instead of welfare, and there are time limits now and there are other constraints around welfare. How would that play out? And let me just kind of throw in the Andrew Yang basic wage, thousand dollar a month concept. You know, what, what would be a specific way to actually mobilize work given the job opportunities? And then how can people work in a way that they can earn a wage that can afford the cost of housing and the costs of living? So Joel or Marshall, why don't you kind of flesh that out a little bit? And then everybody else can turn on you and tell you why it will or not. That's great. And, and, and by the way, I know Mike is going to have some great thoughts about this. You know, um, my personal opinion is that the, that people are going to need to figure out how to become, um, how to generate income on their own in a more self-reliant kind of a way. We've had a model where in the past, large companies have been kind of the you know, benefactor hiring hundreds of thousands of people to give them a job. I, my, I think the whole notion of kind of the, the post-industrial middle class actually comes from uh, large companies saying, hey, you know, if you're not going to be an entrepreneur and take all the risk and you're not going to be a farmer, what are you going to be? You're going to be middle class industrial worker. And I think that's, that's the history of all of this. But we're in a world now that um, because Technology is giving everybody access to markets and access to information. And we've been able to democratize the, the intellectual infrastructure involved in being an entrepreneur. We just need to be able to make it a little less risky for people to do that. And in my mind, that was kind of the role of, gig, of the gig economy, right? People being able to say, hey, you know, I'm going to dip my toe into entrepreneurship by being able to perform services, not be an employee, but take a little bit of risk. The demand is there, so I know I can, I, I can make a living, but take a little bit of a risk of going out on the edge, just slightly uncomfortable for me to learn how to do it. And I think this is a very important element going forward to be able to give people the incentive to kind of unplug from the corporate teat so Marshall, hold that thought. And so Michael, maybe respond to the, yeah. you know, in California, the gig worker, uh, according to a piece of legislation, AB5, is now required to be an employee and is losing their ability to be an independent contractor. Um, 
but it almost sounds as you would be advocating for the unionization of gig workers, whether they're employees or they remain independent. Kind of explain your thought about that continuum of organization. Well, I, I think you have to distinguish the social class of the workers. Uh, if you look at most so-called small businesses in the United States, they're actually upper middle class professionals doing consulting in banking, you know, services, architecture, things like that. It, it, this California law sounds terrible for them, right? Get rid of it. Fine, they're affluent people. Uh, if you're an involuntary gig worker, uh, if you're only a gig worker because this corporation reclassified its workforce, instead of being full-time workers, now you're a gig worker, congratulations. It's just insulting them to say, you've been kicked out of our full-time workforce, congratulations, you're an entrepreneur. So, you know, my other caution about entrepreneurialism is, uh, this was my previous book with Robert D. Atkinson, The Economist, called Big is Beautiful, Debunking the Myth of Small Business. The fact is, across the board, even in 2020, uh, you are likely to get higher wages if you are part of the 50% of Americans who work for a company with 500 or more employees. Uh, small businesses tend to pay poorly, have no benefits, through no fault of their own. They don't have huge profit margins, and, and you can do things to help workers other than crippling the small businesses. But most small businesses fail. Uh, very few small businesses survive to their year, and the ones that do survive tend to become big businesses. So, so I would just be cautious. And, and my final thought about this is, as individuals, it may make sense to escape from the low-wage working class by becoming an entrepreneur, by going to college, getting an education. That will help a few people in every generation get out of this low-wage working class, say 20%. What about the 80% who remain, right? So we need to have a conversation about both, you know, upper mobility out of the low-wage working class by all means, but we also have to have policies for the majority who uh, do not escape. So Joel, I mean, the, every Uber driver, I think with one exception or Lyft driver that I've had, has enjoyed their independence because it's something they do on the side. It augments their regular income. So, and I'm, I'm curious your response to Michael's comment about small business as well, since my understanding is the vast majority of job growth starts out among small business growth. Big corporations don't necessarily add net net jobs. But Joel, what is your reaction to which of these paths can lead towards living wages for people? Well, you know, to quote uh, President Obama, all of the above, um, you know, <laughs> I think, yes, we need um, entrepreneurship and the gig economy certainly helps people. But at the same time, we need to be able to um, maintain you know, large companies that can provide the base. Um, Mike and I are working right now on a study about reshoring industry. Um, and one of the things that's killing California and, and Marshall and my research is, is that we have very few large companies, particularly here in Southern California. Northern California is quite different. In Southern California, there are barely any Fortune 500 companies. So what does that affect? That affects who their advertising agency is, who, um, who um, represents them um, in, in the legal area. In other words, what we're finding is that where you have concentrations of large companies, they spin out a lot of smaller and higher wage jobs. So one of the things we also worked um, with both Carla and Mike are, are on this is in a place called Fayetteville, um, Arkansas, which you would think is the middle of nowhere and the people don't even know how to wear shoes. But the reality is that Fayetteville is doing great and particularly doing great for minorities. Now, what does Fayetteville have? It has Walmart. It has J.B. Hunt, one of the biggest trucking companies, and it has Tyson Foods, all sorts of jobs that are created. And then a whole world of business and professional service firms who work with those companies. So the problem we have, in, let's say in California and increasingly New York, is we have a very high end of company, but not a lot of middle end companies. So for instance, you think of McKesson as I, when my first job was in San Francisco um, as a journalist, and I'd walk by the McKesson headquarters on, uh, in those days on Market Street. 
And McKesson employed thousands of middle managers and people in warehouses. And guess what? McKesson is now in the uh, North Dallas suburbs and they've got the contract to handle the vaccine when it comes out. Well, and but, we've chased them away. Right, we've chased them away. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so it may be convenient to say, oh, we have a new economy and it's gig workers and, and entrepreneurs. And those are all great things. But without those solid big companies, very hard for people to run careers, very hard for people to save money, certainly hard for them to buy a house. I mean, when you go to buy a house, one of the first things they ask you is, who's your employer? I mean, I was able to buy this house because Chapman University is my employer. And, and people considered that a difference. If I had to put it together as a freelancer, it would have been much more difficult. So Pete, can you, I? Yeah, Pete, you, you mentioned in your comment about maybe using a COVID relief bridge, you know, financial assistance as an opportunity for um, instituting some change. Maybe, maybe walk us through that a little bit more. And, and as it applies to how people can get on their feet and kind of get on a path. Sure, yeah, well, I'm really looking at that as more of a stopgap measure as we're trying to get through uh, a period where more than 210,000 people have died and more than 8 million people have been uh, affected by COVID. I personally lost four family members uh, to COVID uh, over the last, uh, nine, 10 months or so. So I've seen how it can affect us. Uh, and I know how it's affected, uh, particularly small businesses. Uh, and uh, I think that we need to have some of those kind of supports, uh, especially over the ne next uh, six months to a year to be able to help ease those uh, businesses, small business owners, entrepreneurs, uh, so that we can uh, get back to some sort of new vision of where, what our reality is, uh, our future is going to be. Uh, I wanted to make a couple of comments about uh, entrepreneurship and, and housing. Uh, one of the things related to entrepreneurship and housing is that I think we need to be aware of where we stand uh, with, with small business. Uh, I think we need to be aware of the, the disparities that come with lending. Uh, we, I think we often see in uh, Black and Latino communities uh, the inability to get the kind of lending, uh, the resources to start businesses. I know of many people who have the ability uh, as black uh, entrepreneurs to start businesses, but are running things out of their home because they just don't have the means to be able to get the loans to be able to support the place, uh, the business that they would like to start. Similarly, the same thing happens with uh, uh, lending for uh, housing, for mortgages. Uh, a recent report came out here that said that uh, Lincoln Park, uh, an affluent neighborhood in Chicago, receives more mortgage lending than the entire west and south sides of Chicago, which are predominantly African-American. Uh, and that uh, white neighborhoods, I believe, receive seven times more uh, mortgage lending than, the, than uh, African-American and Latino neighborhoods in Chicago. So those are real challenges that I think that are obstacles in terms of both uh, uh, entrepreneurship and, uh, and, and of course housing. Uh, and I think we also need to be able to look at the kinds of supports that would be uh, helpful for, the, uh, for people who wanna go that path too. Uh, childcare, for example, is a very high and very expensive proposition for a lot of people. I think that we need to look at greater state or federal investment in childcare so that we can consider that opens up things for people to be able to uh, to take on that risk, as Marshall says, so that they are able to start a new business. So I think those are the kinds of uh, midterm and longer term things that I think that we need to get to so that we can help facilitate the growth of the middle class. So Car Carla, would you rather work for a big company or be independent? <laughs> it depends on where in my life I am and what opportunities I, I'm, I'm given, right? It's not the right answer for everybody. Uh, but I wanted to um, I wanted to just hone in a little bit on what Pete said. So I have worked at, with small businesses and uh, and and low income families in attaining home ownership. So that was my my career. Uh, when it comes to small businesses, I just want to make sure that we don't fall into a like there's one answer. Like that we are going to have to attack this at all angles wherever possible. Uh, one of the one of the things I noticed is that this idea of small business is really not reflective 
of who we're trying to talk about when we talk about low income small business. Low, low income small businesses, for example, in the Latino community where I come from and with whom I work, uh, would be like small panaderias, which are small bakeries, uh, small restaurants uh, that you know are catering tacos to uh, low income families. Uh, the SBA is really not connected to those micro businesses. So I think we also have to understand the difference between entrepreneurship and in, in where in entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship for the tech or entrepreneurship for the middle or low income class. And in the low income class, I do think there is a huge opportunity to help those small businesses, which are the backbones of many of the small local economies. Um, they need help with technology. They need, they, this is the reality we're facing, right? A lot of these small businesses that are um, Latino, Asian, uh, black, they don't use, uh, they don't have the ability to switch into technology quickly and do no contact, you know, deliveries. Uh, they need the technical assistance, they need the support. It's not just about money, it's about people helping people. Again, I want to come back to we are going to, we're in this together. I know that when my neighbor has a good income, and many of my neighbors have good incomes, and they have security, and they have purpose, and they have community. It's a better, it's a better community to, to live in, than to, than to not have that, that type of community. And I think that small businesses foment that, that, uh, that community stance. And that homeownership, uh, there are many um, examples how homeownership also foments that. And you know, as a working class, what are your options for investment? A small business, a home, a retirement plan. What else? I don't know, it's a question for you. But if we don't have any other investment tools for middle income and low income families, well, let's think of some, right? Because the options we have at the table are no longer viable. Right, Marshall? Yeah, I was gonna say, Carla, you know, it's interesting this, the disruption that has happened because of COVID is a really interesting example of how that community um, point that you're talking about can work out. I see a lot of small restaurants who, um, who have made the successfully made the transition from in you know in-house dining to you know to the the takeout and and delivery world and the a tremendous number of them especially the non-chain ones right the independent ones have said to me um you know we really didn't know how to do this but our kids helped us figure it out and the neighborhood kids came over and helped us figure out. So I think there actually is a strong undercurrent of, um, of grassrootsness that's starting to emerge from this. And what I really find particularly encouraging is the notion that the next generation is helping that older generation figure out, you know, how to adapt to kind of a new economic calculus. And that's something that I'm not sure we really saw that so much in the past especially on this kind of micro scale. So I think you're right. I think there's definitely gold in the notion of kind of community grassroots engagement, even on a small business level. And Marshall, okay, but what, what, are they, what are they paying their workers? Uh, as I said, the BLS, the, the two, two of the three jobs that are growing the most are fast food workers and restaurant cooks and care about restaurant owners. I frankly don't. If they pay their workers poorly, I don't care if they're a community institution. I want those workers to be paid well. And if they do not have a business model that allows them to pay their workers well, then let them go out of business. Workers outnumber business owners 10 to 1 in the U.S. Yeah, but I, can, I grant that, right? Everybody needs to be properly uh, paid for their job. Two things, two things to consider. One is a lot of the small businesses that we're talking about are family owned businesses. So the workers are the kids and maybe incredibly exploited kids because there's a tiny number of the workers. money, right? But, the, um, but nonetheless, they're, they're family owned businesses. And then, you know, the other aspect of all of this is that um, the number of workers that are gonna be required to actually do the business are going to be are going to be reduced so that the and pricing power has gone up as anybody who's done any takeout or delivery services have noticed so that actually the capability to pay the fewer workers that you're going to need should go up so should the people that are working there make a living wage or more money yeah sure of course they should but the point is that 
there is a whole new business model that these businesses need to embrace that will allow them to do that. So it could be a win-win, Mike. Yeah, it might be. I, so Joel, go ahead. I just, uh, I, I hate to sound like the voice of reason, um, but. Uh, I, I was gonna say, this is a whole new <laughs> problem for Joel. Go ahead. <laughs> Maybe it's my age. Um, but a couple of things. One, I want to off Pete's point. Um, I just want to share my reporting experience here in Southern California. What I found particularly unfortunate about the way that the COVID response was, is it favored the already well-capitalized bigger companies and had nothing to do with the wages. Applebee's doesn't pay any better than, than you know the corner taqueria. But what I did think was really unfortunate is the way they did it, um, independent businesses had a very hard time. I, the UPS store um, owned by an Indian immigrant that we go to, he was just frothing about how, how does Ruth Chris get money from the government, but I can't. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really uh, very, very critical um, on, the, on this whole issue is in doing interviews in East LA and South LA, what they kept telling me is, I've got a shoe store on Cesar Chavez Boulevard. I have to. St I had to close. My customers were going to Target. My customers were going and buying the the their shoes somewhere else. So I think that what next time, or if we deal with these kinds of emergencies, we have to figure out strategies so that we just don't um, make it actually easier for larger businesses to do best. The other thing is. I, the way I keep trying to go with a continuum, I think if we have good, strong, big companies and manufacturing jobs and skilled jobs, then restaurants go back to being what they always were. You know, I find it so depressing to walk into a fast food restaurant and I see a 45 year old person working there. When I was a kid and I did this work myself in New York in the delis, um, you know, you, uh, that was something you did when you were 16 or 17 or 18, or maybe somebody did it as a part-time job. What's terrible now is that oh, Lucy Dunn at the Orange County Business Council makes this uh, statement. She worked at Disneyland as a kid. She said, Disneyland, everybody was 15, 18, 20, and it was great for that group, get, learn how to work, make a little extra money, but now this is becoming a full-time situation. So if these companies don't want to have to pay much higher wages and benefits, uh, they're going to have a very rough time. We have got to have an economy where there's an upward mobility for people in their 20s and 30s to do something other than a low-wage job. And at the same time, for opportunities for the, you know, the small entrepreneur who can support his family on, on this kind of business. So again, I go back to President Obama's uh, idea of all of the above. Um, all right. So we're going to do a solution. lightning round because there are a lot of <laughs> structures that create the distortions that exist. And so FICA scores, mortgage tax deductions, banking regulations. So what's the one change you would make, you would make if you were elected president and you have a few days left to make that happen? What one structural change would you make to see the income for jobs, the job opportunities, you know, the ability to afford basic living? What's the one structural change that you would make? Uh, we're gonna start with you, Pete. <laughs> Somehow I knew you were gonna start with me. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, federal minimum wage increase. Let's go with that. All right, Mike. Well, we haven't talked about the consumer, the credit side much, but I would change payday lending laws. Right now, it's perfectly legal in the United States to charge somebody 3,000% interest on an annualized basis. And if you look at the working poor and working people, they have an enormous amount of their income is going, to, they're in these debt traps. They can never possibly pay down their credit cards no matter how long they live. So, so I think that's gotta be part of the individual personal credit reform. No. Uh, I think one of the things we might want to explore um, is some of the programs where um, working people um, are, are uh, get, they get help from the government, but 
for working. In other words, I can earn some sort of negative income tax like uh, Milton Friedman talked about. I think that made, makes a lot of sense. What I worry about the most, and um, uh, our, you know, my, a mutual friend of, of, of Mike and mine, uh, um, Ernie Cortez talks about this at Industrial Areas Foundation, is we have to uh, we have to incentivize work. I think if we have a society where people say, "Hey, I'm not going to go work at um, at like my daughter does at Home Depot," you know, I'm not going to do that kind of hard work because I can get the money from the government. That is going to have such a debilitating effect on our society um, that it will be a disaster. So, I think how to give incentives to work whether it's higher minimum wage or whether it's a, a um, some sort of negative income tax, but work I think is an essential value. Um, and that if we, and, and to tell people as, as Dr. King said, if we, if, if people don't have incomes and they don't have, um, they don't have a, a job, what kind of person are they going to be? What, what are the, what's, how are they going to relate to their children? Um, modern Joel, can I interrupt real quick, though? I, I would just say that uh, I agree with you, but I believe businesses, corporations need to value the workers as much as you're asking the workers to value the jobs. Yes, definitely. And, and you know, um, and uh, fortunately, there in some businesses, like my daughter works at Home Depot, they gave her a $3 an hour raise because she's such a good worker. We have to businesses have to understand that a, a dedicated worker, even with minimal skills, is a valuable person. Right. So remember, this is a lightning round. Right. Uh, Marshall. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with uh, the tried and true lever that has worked for social mobility for the last hundred years, education. I think it needs fixing. I think it needs to be made free. I think we need to get as, and, and it needs to be interpreted broadly, not just a university education. I think we need to include vocational skills uh, in all of that, because I think that regardless of whether it's gonna be the company and employer that's gonna employ people or entrepreneurship, um, we're moving into a world where um, we just need more skills and we're losing that competitive position to the rest of the world by not being able to uh, provide that level of uh, education. So, and maybe this is a Bernie bro thing, forgive me, but I think that we need to get rid of the educational debt that's hanging around the necks of all of the people that have been going down that path so they can actually get a leg going up, uh, leg up in, uh, in savings so they can actually start to build some prosperity. Carla's gonna pay you for that. Carla, your thought. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I'm just going to say that um, I, if I was president, I don't think that I could solve things that communities have to solve on their own. So I would like for a uh, community to come together and, and solve local, local issues. So yes, the federal government has a lot of influence in housing, for example, but they don't decide what type of housing we have at the local level. So people need to get involved. The other thing, uh, so we need to understand, I think, as citizens, we need to understand who to go to for what. So the president does not decide your housing. It doesn't decide your education. That is done at the state and local levels. Um, that's where we need to start innovation. It, it shouldn't come from the top. But if we were to talk about the top and I was president, I would really encourage a continuation of um, interdisciplinary uh, decision body making um, structures. And what I, but I, what I mean by that is that these education leaders need to be talking to the uh, business sectors and the business sectors need to be talking to the housers and the housers need to be talking to the transportation. And I just do not see those silos being efficient. So if, I, if it was structural, I would make the interdisciplinary um, ideals uh, much more part of, of government. And I would also change govern, how we govern ourselves uh, yeah. by opening up um, to the people to, to participate more actively. So since you were given one, I'll give you the second one, just sign up as a freebie. And along those lines, I'll go ahead and throw in the fiscal structure of government at all level and the intentional and unintended consequences of how we tax things. All right, final round. And this, I think, goes to the issue of, okay, so we have ideas about what to be done. How do we get it done? in today's political environment, 
where I will say that baby boomers, who are probably the most selfish generation in the history of our country, are still in control. And they have no desire to give up anything that they've taken from society, you know, from society over our generation. So the political, what, what is the political dynamic that we need to strive for that can lead to change? Marshall. Oh God, that has got to be the toughest thing. I mean, I'm just, you know, Rodney King. Yeah. <laughs> Can't we just all get along? I mean, this, this is, it just strikes me that, um, we've created such an intentionally toxic, intentionally polarized political environment that um, people are relishing the notion of not being able to do anything. And so I, we just have to find a, a uniting principle. Historically, in these kinds of situations, the enemy is externalized, right? We have a war, we have something where we can point to and say, oh, there's the bad guys, we need to all get together to um, to go up against them, uh, we given the given the implications of that, I'm not sure I want that. But I don't well, really not. know, honestly, Steve. Okay, Michael. Well, I, I agree with Marshall. In, in my book, The New Class War, I suggested that maybe nothing short of great power politics would focus the minds of the privileged elites in the U.S. The reason we had a civil rights revolution was uh, embarrassment in the Cold War competition with the Soviets, uh, our, our people who, who, this wasn't benevolence, it was, a, it, was a, it was a disability in our competition for post-colonial regimes. Uh, in World War II, we boosted unions to keep the war production going, not because there was any great love of organized labor. And again, I hope that doesn't happen. The alternative is the uh, elite, which has most of the power and privilege and money, is frightened by rebellions from below. And I think they should be frightened the Sanders insurgency represented a certain group of overeducated, underpaid people who are becoming a bigger part of the population. The, uh, the Trump voters, not Trump himself, but a lot of the voters represented another group of left behind people. So uh, we'll see whether the Republican and Democratic elites are sufficiently shaken up by the Sanders and Trump phenomena that they undertake real reform or they think, well, we'll just go back to business as usual, uh, uh, assuming Donald Trump is out of office. Carla. Okay, repeat the question because I want to make sure I, I'm answering the right thing. How do we create the political environment that can actually lead to the changes necessary to save the middle class? Okay, we need to stop this um, Democrat Republican thing. We got to stop this race thing. Um, everybody's affected by this problem. Um, politics are taking away their like dangling um, and distracting us from the real work we have to do together. Again, your community will be affected by the election, but it's not, it's not decided by politics, should not be decided by politics. And it, it ha you have to insert yourself in the, in the mix. You have to be part of the solution. You can no longer go to these representatives and ask them to fix this. It's not fixable by them. It's not fixable, it definitely. The, you know, the person that has been rich this entire time is not going to wake up one day and be like, you know what, I've been rich for too long and I'm going to start giving my money away now and I'm going to change it. It's not going to come from them. It's not going to come from government. It's going to, it's going to come from us. And uh, for that, I think that the local governments need to create avenues of communication for people where their ideas, their talents and their skills are able to infiltrate and help uh, build better communities, inform the planners of what the what the hopes and aspirations of the, and you know, what else do you have to offer? I, I have very strong feelings that we have not tapped into the entire talent pool and skill pool of the people that we have. We have underutilized our human resources. We're not thinking about people uh, in, a, in a nation, in a national, in even community sense. We're not thinking of people of human resources that have talents and skills. We still treat them as like they're workers. You know, you see uh, Blacks and Hispanics, they are thought of, uh, as you know, workers for construction, but there are mathematicians, there are statisticians, there's um, there there are entrepreneurs, there are artists. There are so many of those talents in those communities, and we're not fully utilizing our, our human resources. So we need to think more critically about who lives in the U.S. and what can they contribute, um, and how can we help them thrive so that we can all benefit from that. E. Uh, first of all, I want to say yay to Michael for uh, bringing up uh, interest convergence. 
that uh, some of the things that have happened previously did not happen out of the generosity of our hearts. They happened because they were a means to an end. And I think you're right about that. I think that uh, we need to have, uh, we know what needs to be done. We need to have uh, the overeducated, underpaid Bernie supporters get with the left behind Trump supporters and realize that they are all working towards a common goal. And I think that we could see, uh, believe it or not, some real agreement on many of the things that need to happen at the federal, state, and local levels. Uh, I really think that, uh, however, that this is not gonna happen uh, in a potential Biden administration. I'm guessing at this point, uh, uh, this is a caretaker, a potential caretaker administration as we sort of write the wrongs of the last four years or the last 40 years, depending on how you look at it. And then I think we'll uh, eventually get into a direction where uh, Gen Xers like myself or millennials are going to take the mantle and be able to steer this ship in a new direction. So uh, that's how I see it. Joel. Okay. Um, basically, I, I, mean, I agree with the, the, most of the sentiments. The problem we have now is um, Trump did identify some very good and critical issues, but he did it in such a ham-handed way to make this unity that Pete is talking about, which I think is a great idea between the, the Trump supporters and the Bernie supporters and even large parts of the, uh, of the poor and working class population. But you can't, do, you can't build a sustainable working class coalition based on nativism, given that 50% of the working class uh, is going to be Hispanic, Asian, or um, African American. So, I, I, but the biggest thing I want to get into um, over time is let's talk about results, not about rhetoric. I mean, um, if you think about what's happening with um, the big corporations in this country, frankly, supporting, you know, environmental, gender, race, you know, virtue signaling is a great way for them to deal with the, the problems of their public relations. What would be much better is if they dealt with the issue, not about how they feel good about themselves, but about how they treat their employees, how they bring production, if, it, if they have production, um, back to the United States. What we really should be scrutinizing companies is not who's on their board of directors or you know, what their policy is on transgender workers, what we really should care about is how do they treat their workers? Are they creating jobs? Are they creating good paying jobs? And right now that discussion is not taking place seriously in either party. Well, you know, one, one quick add to that because I think Carla has actually put her finger on the real answer here, which is in essence, grassrootsness, right? I don't, maybe I'm, it's not exactly the right definition of grassroots, but it's just do it. Right, get out there, start working. Don't necessarily look to government for policy guidance. There is no grand strategy. Just get out there and do it, whether you're an individual who, who, who is going to demand that they get services from the government or whether you're an employer who, as, as Mike says, not out of self-interest, not out of um, any kind of uh, munificence, uh, is going to try to, um, you know, uh, make changes at the micro level in their businesses to be more efficient, to be create more loyalty among the employees, so they don't have the same co they don't have high costs of replacing them. You know, these are not policy level issues. They're they're just do it ish, uh, situations. Napoleon. So let me uh, last question, lightning round, uh, Marshall. I'm going to start with you. What gives you the most hope for the future of the middle class? Good question. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I'll tell you what gives me the most hope. I have classes in my, at Chapman University that I teach in new product development and in um, marketing analytics. What gives me hope is I have first generation learners in my classes um, from first generation university students, largely Latino, who are um, 
who say to me, I'm here because I really want to, I want to make a difference. I want to, I want to excel. I want to, I realize there are new skills out there that I need to learn in order to be able to make things better for me and for my future family. That human spirit is what gives me the hope. Absolutely. Pete. I agree. Uh, I think the hope for the middle class uh, lies within uh, the younger generation that's coming up. Uh, I think that there is a desire to recreate the middle class as we know it that exists among that group. I think that they are going to be the ones who will be pushing for uh, whatever uh, supports we need to help uh, 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 give it the, the the tools that it needs to be able the, the infrastructure that we need for the middle class to survive and thrive. And uh, I really look forward to seeing them as they uh, as they rise up in their political and uh, economic awareness. Carla. I'm going to echo that. It's the power is the fire in our bellies that will get us out of this. Um, if it, it that's the way this this country was built. Um, it was not built by the elites. It was built by people that had fire in their belly. Um, we have in California a, a huge advantage, actually. We, a lot of the people that are here are like me. We know we are immigrants that know that institutions are important. And when those institutions do not work, it has terrible consequences. My family moved because we had kitchen table conversations very similar to the ones that we're having now here in California, where we could no longer maintain our middle class status and when we got here we became poor <laughs> and i will tell you that you know nothing is granted so it was the fire in our bellies that allowed us to move forward and that's what i'm trying to tap into that that everybody has fire in their bellies everybody has ideas and we need to let those ideas flourish because that's what government good government is about it's allowing these ideas to bubble up and the best ones to help everybody and we rally around those and i really want to um just remind everybody that we're talking about a technology revolution. I think that broadband and, and digital access will be crucial to democracy in the future. Uh, there are tons of people right now who do not have access to education because there's no, no internet connection despite having uh, devices. Um, that is the, the future generation uh, of, of low-income families that need to have that access because it's inevitable not to not to build your community without that technology, if that's where we're heading. Michael. Yeah, I sort of agree on, on the technology in the long run. I, I think it favors the working class majority in as much as a lot of the high incomes that we associate with professionals, doctors and lawyers and even professors, I'm a professor now, are basically what economists would call rents. You're using your, your, the, the premium prices because there's some kind of bottleneck in scarcity. And so you can charge more. And uh, as you move to online education, uh, have uh, AI that can write your will instead of paying a doctor, a lawyer, this enormous amount of money, then I think there will be a, a certain, it will be bad for you know, a small number of well-paid people, but, but it will mean that a lot of the high prices uh, that, are, that ordinary Americans pay to very well-to-do professionals and, and I do, in spite of, you know, my, I, I've been somewhat skeptical about some of the claims for small business, but uh, a lot of the information economies of scale that big businesses have traditionally had in terms of access to uh, consumers, research, things like that, I think that uh, AI and, and other technological innovations will empower small businesses. There'll be sort of a level uh, playing field. So I, so I do think in the long run, even in the absence of social and political reform, that technology is gonna undercut certain kinds of privilege. Very good, Joel. All right, just three points. One, I, I get a great deal of, of hope um, in the focus groups that um, Marshall and I have been doing on uh, post COVID. Um, these young people, um, I think they really want, they wanna make a, dis a difference. They're not just talking about how much money they could make. Um, the second thing is, I think the openness, um, you know, despite all the talk about race, I'm amazed by the amount of intermixing. I am just astounded by it. Um, the, and I think that, that we will come out of this with a population where a large number of people 
are have either dated somebody from another ethnic group or they've uh, or they've married somebody from another ethnic group. And so I think that that's going to be very helpful. And the last thing is I do think there's a confluence, and I think Pete uh, uh, touched on it, where people are beginning to realize, you know what, the world that we're being taught, told about from the oligarchs and all that, that we have to stand up against it. And this coalition that's developing among some Republicans and some Democrats to understand that these issues of class are the key issues in front of us. And once we know that, then I think we'll, we'll have a, a change. And I think that the idea of class is beginning to become more and more evident to more and more people. And it's beginning to change the nature of politics in, in both parties. And hopefully there'll be a meeting of the minds at least on some policy. So I'm optimistic in that sense. Very good. Well, to all of you, great job. This was a fun conversation. Maybe we do it again next Saturday. Tom, yeah. I'm going to turn it over to you, but thank you all to the panelists. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. And, and thanks to all the, the panelists. This was really a, a great discussion. And I think it, it reminds us every, it reminds all of us of the important issues. I would also just say it reminds us all of the importance of decisions that we can all make in, in terms of it's voting season right now. So I think everyone that, that, that listens to this and listens to the issues that you talk about, you know, we, we as citizens have power in terms of the decisions that we make and, and vote, whether that's at the top of the ticket or the, all the uh, initiatives that we look at also. So I think I would remind everyone that, that voting is really important in terms of the issues that you talk about. Um, so thank you again. Thanks to Manaz Azagari uh, for working behind the scenes and Charlie Stevens um, and, and working with Facebook Live. Um, this is being recorded, so uh, we'll be able to post it and, and get uh, segments of this out to, to others afterwards. Um, and then one final last plug, uh, we are, we're continuing these ASEAN experts. Our next one is October 27th. Uh, it's going to be on mental health and, and wellness, and uh, that's a top issue that we've heard a lot about, um, especially with COVID over the last seven months now. So with that, I will end it and uh, have a great rest of your weekend. And thanks again, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.